It's always a joy to praise the Lord, but now let's turn to his word together. And we're going to read um, all of 2 Samuel chapter 9. That's 2 cha Samuel chapter 9, uh, from verses 1 to 13. And um, it's the well-known story of David and Mephibosheth. May the Lord speak to all our hearts. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so when they called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he answered, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kind the, the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lo-Debar. Uh, then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lo-Debar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. Uh, so David said to him, Don't fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread continually at my table. Then Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, What is your servant, that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king said to Ziba, uh, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to, to all his house. Um, you therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may always have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded, his servant, so, sh sh so shall your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Mika, and all who dwelt in the, the house of Ziba were the servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Let's bow our heads and pray. Let's have a brief word of prayer to the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your, your good and holy word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. In your word, when we read it, we hear your voice speaking to us. And we thank you that brings wisdom to our minds, sets before us the direction in which we should go, according to the truth that you have given us and in which we rejoice. I do now pray that as we gather round your word this evening, there would be that sense again of you speaking to us. There would be a sense of the Holy Spirit uh, working in our hearts, that we might have a, a love for those who are suffering, that we might be practical in our love and show it in gracious and in kind ways. And we pray that this cold world in which we live, in which so many people are cruel and heartless, would see in your people those who are like Jesus Christ. We do pray now and ask that you would hear our prayers, because we bring them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, a few weeks ago I watched um, the film uh, uh, 12 Years a Slave. I have to say, not all of it. Some scenes I, I had to miss. Uh, but this film told the story of Solomon Northup, a free black man in America two centuries ago. And he earned his money playing the, the violin. He was a wonderful violinist uh, before he was stolen, uh, before he was sold into slavery. And there is a, a slave, Solomon, endured much. He endured the heat and the beatings and the hard work. 
and not with a bad attitude, but with initiative and respect and effort. Uh, and one evening when Solomon was walking home, uh, his master called to him, Solomon. And Solomon came near and, and his master looked in a box and, and he brought out a violin. And uh, his master offered it to him, a violin for Solomon the violinist. And Solomon hadn't asked for this. No money was requested. This was a free gift. And yet as Solomon took it and walked away, the expression on his face said it all. Uh, that in this hard world in which we all live, uh, Solomon had experienced something. It wasn't just goodness, nor was it even generosity, but it was that something we could call kindness. Let me ask you a question, a very simple question. Are you a kind person? God is holy, God is good, but I will never forget the day I first heard God is kind. And he is. True kindness doesn't come from the theory of evolution, the animal world. True kindness is the language and the accent and the heart of heaven. Think back to the last act of kindness you received. And let me tell you, ultimately, it came from the heart of God. But what does kindness mean? What actually is it? It's very interesting for those of us who work with Romanians. In the Romanian language, there is no word for kindness. We as Romanian people are always reaching around for a definition. And so let me suggest to you three things. And the first is that kindness is free. With true kindness, it's beyond obligation. I have a book here at home and it's called the, the Law of Kindness. But you know, when you think carefully in relation to kindness, there is no law as such. True kindness comes without obligation, without expectation. There is no sense that something must or should be done. With true kindness, someone said, the person who receives it is always slightly surprised, is asking, why did they do that? So when it comes to birthday presents for family, wedding presents, Christmas presents, these are all good things, but they don't quite reach the level of kindness. True kindness comes without obligation and is a total surprise. When were you last kind to someone? Secondly, kindness is selfless. Kindness is selfless. I am not thinking about me. I'm not doing this for me. Back in the film I mentioned, uh, Solomon's master gives him the violin and he gives him the violin with these words. I hope this violin brings much joy to us both. And it will. The only person happier and the one receiving kindness is the one giving kindness. The person who is kind. But we're not being kind so that we can feel good. We're not being kind to do this for ourselves. If our kind actions are like a piece of glass, I don't turn the glass into a mirror to look at myself. I turn the glass into a window to look through and to focus on others. When were you last kind to someone? Because thirdly, I can tell you kindness is helpful. It's considerate. It's done for the good of the other person. You know, in my family, Irene likes me to buy her flowers and Dave likes me to buy him chewing gum. That's the way things work in our family. But if I get that the wrong way around, which is totally possible for an old man like me and I give the chewing gum to Irene and the flowers to Dave, that might be funny, but it's no longer kind. Because kindness is free. Kindness is selfless. And kindness is helpful. When were you last kind to someone? When were you last kind to anyone? Kindness is a language understood in every nation. Kindness is a language that speaks to our hearts. Kindness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, something for which this world thirsts. The kindness of God is at the heart of our redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ, and it should be in the hearts of the redeemed. Let's say this evening, let kindness fill the church. Let the kindness of God be seen everywhere among us. May I and you, may we be responsible for showing this kindness of God to all the people that we meet. Yet we still ask a question. To whom specifically, purposely, should this kindness be shown? Well, that's our first point this evening. Who, to whom should the kindness be shown? 
And then secondly, we ask, well, what does this kindness of God actually involve? That's our second heading this evening. But as we look at these things, may the Lord truly be speaking to us that we might show this kindness to others uh, so that the world might see whose disciples we are. Now, to whom should this kindness be shown? The first of our two points. Now, let's try and enter into the situation of Mephibosheth just a little, just a little. Now, let's just imagine um, that your father was killed in battle when you were five years old. Now, imagine your grandfather was killed in the same battle on exactly the same day. And on that day, when you were just a little child, someone picked you up to run, but they fell and you were hurt and you never walked again. That was the life story of Mephibosheth. And a reminder that some children have suffered more by the age of five than anyone should suffer in a lifetime. And a little reminder that many children suffer and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. Now Mephibosheth, he was lame in both feet, not one foot, but both feet. That meant he couldn't use crutches. Now bones that are broken badly in childhood can remain disfiguring all your life. For this little boy, no football ever, no races with his friends, not even simply standing up. And the years pass for this, this little lad Mephibosheth and there's no sudden healing, uh, no miracle and it's all better. Is a lame child who becomes a lame adolescent and a lame adult. And it's all in a place called Lodibar, which literally means nothing or nowhere or no grass, a place so small it seems not to really exist. Mephibosheth has a little son himself, but he always remembers Mephibosheth. My granddad was a king, my father Jonathan was a warrior, but I myself am a handicapped person. And then seemingly from nowhere. The new king calls, David calls, and this must be the call of death. Because back then, kings executed all their rivals, especially grandchildren of previous kings. And so after 20 years of limping, shattered dreams, Mephibosheth must have thought, it all ends today. I'm going to go and I will die by the hand of the person who became king in my place. And as Mephibosheth entered the palace, the palace would have been a place of strong and beautiful people. Did this lame man feel more ashamed of his, of his physical weakness than ever? We don't know. But what we do know is that he felt fear as he fell before David and he waited there for the falling of the sword. But it didn't happen uh, because this king was full of, of the spirit of God, a God who is rich in mercy to the suffering and weak. And Mephibosheth did not hear the words Mephibosheth killed, but instead he heard the words Mephibosheth kindness. God's eternal heart and plan for you, Mephibosheth, is kindness from this king. And that is full of meaning for us all, because let me tell you something. Kindness is good for marriages. Kindness is good for marriages. Without kindness, marriages slowly die. Our little acts of kindness make marriages live. But the kindness of God is looking further than that. Because let me tell you something more. If you have an idea of kindness for, for someone, for anyone, you have an idea of kindness, make sure you turn it into action. I could do this or that for this particular person in an act of kindness. Well, do it. Don't just let it fall to the ground, fall to the wayside, but do it. That's great. But the kindness of God goes further than that. Because when we're thinking of Mephibosheth and asking questions, we do start to ask questions. And they are these. Thinking of Mephibosheth. Do you know anyone who suffered as a child? Who suffered for many years? Or maybe someone who today is just afraid or fearful or troubled in soul. And you say, well, if I meet someone like that, I'll help them. Oh, if I meet them, I'll show them some real kindness. But that's not enough. Because this evening we're considering the kindness of God. And as David says, I will search for such people. I will look for these people who are in need. I will ask, where are they? I will inquire, is there anyone 
Do you know of anyone I can help? And so we, 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 search, we, we say we will search for these people, those people in need of our kindness. We will listen in conversations to find out who is suffering. We will search for, for ministries that care for the poor. I will pray, and I hope you will pray too. Lord, guide my path, guide my feet, wherever they need to go so that I might meet these people. And when I find them, when we find them, we will be like King David. Uh, we will not kill them with cruel expressions on our faces. You know how that works. We will not kill these people who suffer with hard words or condemnation. You know how that works. But like our Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to say to these people from the abundance that I have, you will be cared for. You will be cared for. That the Lord has given me plenty, far more than I need, so that I might give to you, so that your soul might be blessed. And together we will show this hard world. A hard world in which people don't just pass you by, they pass you by sometimes with cold expressions and cold hearts. And we will show this hard world that we are the disciples of the one who had compassion, our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we will show the children and the suffering and the fearful something. We will show them something. We truly will show them something. We will look for these people and we will find them. And then in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall show them the kindness of God. Those are the people that we will show the kindness to. But the question now comes, of course, well, in what ways does that kindness show itself? And we've got four ways. Let's go through them one by one, according to what we see in the verses. And the first thing of the, the four things we're going to say about this kindness is its greatness. The greatness of this kindness great kindness extensive huge kindness because we look there at verse 7 and read uh, where it says i will restore to you all the land of saul your grandfather i will restore to you all the land of saul your grandfather now let's make no mistake here Mephibosheth could have said king david thank you for your thoughts thank you for your thoughts you were thinking about me this matters it really does matter Sometimes the kindness of God is just to say to someone, I'm thinking of you. It matters so much. Just something as simple as thoughts. Mephibosheth could have said to David, Oh, David, these words, these kind words that you've spoken to me, are just like Ruth in Ruth chapter 2, verse 13, saying to Boaz, You've spoken good words and they've comforted me. Good words to a friend who needs them. Our friends who, needs them, who need them, this again is an instance, a, a display of the, the kindness of God. Or even gestures, gestures that we make. They can make such a difference. If David here had shaken Mephibosheth's hand, uh, these gestures of kindness, a, a smile to someone sometimes, a hand on their shoulders, um, sometimes a hug. Yes, this can again be the kindness of God. But here... It's more. It's much, much more. Because it's all the land that Saul owned. It, it's all coming back to you, Mephibosheth. It's all coming back to you as a free gift from my hand, from David's hand. And let's think about that for a moment. Now, pretty close to where Irene and I live here in uh, Shirehampton. Just outside Shirehampton is a place called King's Western House. It's here in Bristol. Maybe some of you have visited it. King's Western's ha house, great big mansion what is uh, not commonly known as a stately home. It was built 301 years ago, in the year 1719. It's the only building outside of London designed by the great architect Sir John Vanbrugh. And I can, t I can tell you, as you enter it, it's pretty impressive. The ceiling is 15 metres high. What's that? 45, 50 feet high. And that's just the start, because you go outside of the main building and there are other buildings, stables, a brew house, Smaller houses, some other buildings also designed by Vambra, and then you get the land. Now, originally, the King's Western Estate is much, much bigger than it is today. King's Western Estate originally was 9,000 acres of land, and it wasn't just fields, not just ordinary fields, but hills, woods, rivers, gardens. And people used to travel from all over the country to King's Western Estate and take in the views. John Wesley himself, once going there and saying it had the finest views in the country. What a place. What a location. 
King's Western House, the lands of a rich man. But David gave Mephibosheth the lands of a king. The lands of a king. I put it to us all that this level of kindness is sacrificial. This level of kindness is awesome. This level of kindness is frightening. And sometimes it can seem to us too much. Uh, we say, I can do thoughts. I can do words. I can do gestures. I will try. And this is something the Lord calls it calls for this is an expression of God's love but to give the lands of a king now with all respect and deference to the principles of tithing this is going well beyond any kind of 10 percent this is going to a place where we ourselves are like David who would have been significantly worse off as a result of his kindness now, unquestionably we could say there's something reckless here there's an abandonment of self there is fundamental loss of goods in response to the voice of God and for the good of others. And what is interesting is this, is that these large gestures of kindness, they were there in the book of Acts. They've been there in the church past. But the question is, are they found in our lives today? Are they found in our lives today? And what we say is this, when we ask the question, how could I ever do such a thing? This is what I suggest. What we do is that we wait for the Lord's voice. We wait for the Lord's voice. When it comes to those larger acts of kindness, we don't dis just distribute them wherever we wish, as sometimes acts of folly, but we do wait for the Lord's voice to speak to our hearts. And then we remember him. Not David, not David and his example, but the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you think, even for 10 minutes of heaven, where eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. What the Lord Jesus will give to those who love him. Then we can wait and listen to his voice and whatever kindness he tells us to do. And we can do it. We can do it. Because the kindness of God is not only great. Very interestingly, Secondly, it's personal. It's a personal kindness. Because now we're looking again at verse 7, where it says, I hope you can read it, and you shall eat bread at my table. My table. What a wonderful phrase. What a wonderful expression. And it's a wonderfully symbolic thing. This symbolic provision from now on Mephibosheth whatever you need I will provide for you says David from my table it's a wonderful contrast here you think of poor Mephibosheth all those years in low Debar, the place so small it was uh, as we've said the place from nowhere now he's in the he's in the king's palace what a wonderful comparison I do wonder here is it hinted in the passage an element of adoption uh, not just the servants of David, not the servants of David, but the princes, his sons, sat at his table. Was this, in a real sense, a picture of adoption? But more, and even most importantly, it's my table. It's personal involvement. I am involved. Mephibosheth, when you are receiving the kindness of God through me, you don't just get my gifts and what I can offer to you that way. You get me as well. I will help you, me as well, and that's so important. I remember uh, Liam Goddiger. Uh, he was a pastor in, he is a pastor in uh, Philadelphia, America. And um, I have to say, I've been listening to some of his sermons in, in recent months. They have been among the best sermons I have ever heard, certainly one or two of them. I would say one or two of those sermons were, were better than Spurgeon, better than Lloyd-Jones, better than pretty much anyone I've ever heard. These sermons from Liam Goddiger in Philadelphia, America. Uh, but Liam Goddard, he didn't start his life in America. He started in Scotland, from in a poor family in Scotland. In fact, he said that um, his family was the poorest family in his church. And he knew when he was a child that his family was the poorest family in church. I think children can always sense this. And the richest family in his church belonged to a rich businessman. And Liam Goddard said that rich businessman never gave his family any money. 
I'm sure the rich businessman did give them money, it's just that little Liam never knew it. But although the rich businessman didn't appear to give them money, he did give them something. He showed them interest and he gave them his time. This businessman would speak to Liam Golliger when Liam Golliger was young. Even when he was a boy, the rich businessman would say, Liam, how are you doing? This rich businessman, he would give them time, gave Liam time, would take Liam out in his car and would drive it as fast as, as Liam wanted. And this rich businessman encouraged Liam. He saw that Liam was intelligent. He saw that he was clever. He said, come on, Liam, work hard, study hard at school. And with the result today, after these acts of kindness, that today we have one of the best preachers in the world over there in Philadelphia because of this personal involvement in the acts of kindness. Now, it's very interesting, personal involvement. This is exactly what the world doesn't want when it comes to the kindness of God. And the world wants all the Lord's blessings. The world wants to sit at the Lord's table. They just don't want him to be there, which is very, very sad. But let's think of these things, interest, time, encouragement, in many ways worth far more than money, much more than money. You shall eat at my table, Mephibosheth, and you shall know the kindness of God. Because if the kindness of the Lord was great, it was extensive, the lands of a king, if it was personal at my table, then thirdly, it was also thoughtful thoughtful. Now this is this wonderful stuff that we're considering this evening, the, 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 the kindness of God that we see uh, David um, showing, this great kindness, all the lands of King Saul, when the Lord calls for these great gestures of kindness, then, then we do it at his it's bidding, at his voice, and it's personal, as we've been thinking, the friendship of a king, imagine that, um, not just my money, not just my gifts, but but me as well. But then it's something more. And we look in, in verses 9 and 10 and we, we see that it's thoughtful. It's thoughtful. Uh, Zeba, the servant of Saul. And we look at those verses in verses 9 and 10. You can read them for yourself. And we think, well, that part is just admin. Now, that part is just a few instructions or the, um, the administration of the estate, as the good and the great might call it. Uh, just um, a bit of organizing, just a few practicalities that sort of thing, you do this, he do that, etc., etc. Or was it, the, was it the importance of being thoughtful, of kindness being thoughtful? So let's think for a moment, all right? Let's just think for a moment. Thousands of acres given to Mephibosheth. Wonderful. That's a whole lot of land, a great parcel of land, as we might say in the English language. Who's going to farm it? Who's going to work that land? Who's going to do the work on the land? Oh, you've got one lame man, maybe his wife and his little son. They're going to do the whole thing. Farm the whole land. Well, maybe they had a dog as well, or a horse, or two horses. Now, what David is doing is, can I suggest it's thoughtful. What David is doing is thinking, right? Bephibosheth, as we've said, he'd been living in that place, low debar. The place that could be translated nothing or nowhere, or maybe no pasture. Mephibosheth, how much experience have you got of land management? And by the way, by the way, Zeba, he was a servant of Saul's, uh, Mephibosheth's granddad. Um, so he was probably much older than Mephibosheth, a generation older, a lot more experienced. I have to say this, knowing the corruption of the human heart, there was plenty of, op of, of opportunity there. For Zeba to give Mephibosheth a run around in a, a right royal way. You know, could really have caused trouble to, to Mephibosheth, Zeba, this older, older man. So David gave Zeba the command directly. Zeba, I'm telling you, this is what you're going to do. You're going to administer the estate for, Mesh for Mephibosheth. David gives him the order. And David was a good man. But I don't think anyone wanted to make David angry. So we can see that David was being careful, thinking, showing us that our kindness by thinking, thinking can be improved. Now you've got an idea for kindness, some of you. 
Good. Stop. Think a while to see if it can be improved. Maybe we've got a, a very kind idea, a notion in the back of my mind. You're saying, hmm, yes, I'll do that. Sometimes stop a while. Get a little more wisdom from the Lord. Bring it to him for a few days in prayer to improve it. Maybe you're going to talk about it with some, some other helpful people and get some suggestions from them. How to do it better. I have to be honest, in my life these often come from Irene. These suggestions about how kindness might be improved. Don't resent those suggestions. Don't reject those suggestions of how things can be improved. Embrace them. Thank the Lord for them. See them as an opportunity for improving the kindness that you're going to show another person. Because if the kindness of the Lord is great, if it is personal, if it is thoughtful. Fourthly, what we see from the passage is that sometimes it's continual. Continuity keeps on going. There's one more important word I'd like to draw your attention to um, in this chapter. There's much more that we could say, but just one more important word. It comes first at the end of verse 7, where David says, You will eat at my table continually. But Fibbersheth, you will eat at my table continually. And then guess what? It happened. That happened. Because when you go down to verse 13, we read, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table continually. And so it must be, where necessary, when it comes to showing other people the kindness of God. Now, please don't uh, mistake what I'm meaning at this, at this juncture. Many acts of kindness, perhaps we could even say most acts of kindness, at just a few seconds, just a few hours, maybe a few, a few days. We can show people the real kindness of God. And it's just a few seconds, maybe just a few days. And, and that's often even normally how it is. But what David is saying here is that sometimes after those first exciting new moments at his table, as it was for Mephibosheth, perhaps when people didn't want Mephibosheth to be there, uh, year after year, as it just keeps on going on and it's no longer novel and it's no longer new and people are perhaps thinking isn't it time for Mephibosheth to go and sit at another table elsewhere it all continued it all continued probably and almost certainly for years it all continued and in this we know this is the true kindness of God the true kindness of God I think of um someone by the name of Rob Parsons uh, he's a pastor in the, the Pentecostal church here in Britain I was reading one of his books recently about, about preaching, actually giving illustrations in sermons. And um, he was um, telling a story about himself. He said he hadn't been married very long when um, just before one Christmas there came a knock at his door and at the door stood a young man called Ron who had just left a children's home. And uh, at, uh, Rob Parsons saw that Ron had a, he had a black bag in, in his hand, one hand, in that black bag were all of Ron's possessions. And in the other hand, Ron was holding a frozen chicken. A frozen chicken. Ron didn't know how to cook the chicken. And so the, so Rob's wife said to him, listen, Ron, I'll do that. And if Ron, he had nowhere to go, why didn't he stay with them that night? And it was near Christmas. And so the pastor said, Ron, well, listen, stay till Christmas Day. Stay a few more nights. And they prepared some presents for him and invited him to the Christmas meal and when Ron came to the Christmas meal and enjoyed the afternoon, at the end of it all, he cried because that was the first family Christmas he'd ever known. And it was a most lovely day. And, that, and Rob Parsons went on to say, you know, well, that all happened 40 years ago. That was before he had had children. And since then, his children, Rob Parsons' children, had grown up, got married and left home. Uh, but Ron had stayed there and Ron remained there. And unless Ron ever needed more care than they could offer, he always would be there. And when I heard that, and when I read that, I, I knew, and I'm sure we all know, that this continuity is showing us something of the kindness of God. 
often, dear ones, it's a moment, often a few minutes. Sometimes it's as long as it takes. It's as long as it takes. And maybe you can think of people to whom you've been showing kindness for years. Well, in the grace that God gives us, let us show kindness for years more. Because this is the kindness that God shows to his people after he saved them, then sustaining them through all the days of this life until he takes us from this world to be with him forever. The kindness of God, great, personal, thoughtful, and wherever necessary, continual. Now, as we say in the Romanian Fellowship, I'm just going to end with some words of application for Christians. Um, and this is where we're going to conclude this evening. I want to ask you a few questions covering some of the ground that we've looked at already again. Who are you going to show kindness to this week? Who are you going to surprise with kindness? Because remember what we were saying, true kindness is almost always surprising. Remember, another little bit of a, bit of a recap here. If you get an idea of kindness, oh, I could do this for a certain person I could do that for a certain person well don't just let it fall to the dust turn it into action prayerful action and go ahead and do it and don't just be do one kind thing once a year there we go Christmas birthdays or whatever even though you know what we were saying about that oh just once a once a year some kinds but try to be a kind person always just as our Lord Jesus Christ was a kind person always but I want to Close with some encouragement. And the encouragement goes to you of you in the fellowship who are kind and who have been kind in the past. Do you know every church has some kind people who have been kind in the past and who are kind now and who will be kind in the future? And I'm sure listening this evening are some of them and yet there's a challenge isn't there we do this kindness and yet so often the question of the soul is how can we continue because they tell the truth when it comes to acts of kindness sometimes they're tiring sometimes they're hard and sometimes you seem to be the only person who is being kind and the people receiving kindness are not grateful sometimes the kindness that we would show to others it's happened to me it's happened to you it gets picked up and it gets thrown straight back in our face. That's very sad, but true. And sometimes, if we're honest, I think kindness can seem like a fool's game. And so kindness can seem like the, the acts of a mug. And we have, we have non-Christian family and sometimes Christian family. And they'll be looking at us askance and thinking what's wrong with them. And sometimes we wonder, how can we continue? How can we perpetuate these acts of kindness in a loving, enduring way? And I remember what a pastor once said about the parable of the good Samaritan. He said this, he said in the parable, we need to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, in a sense, the Lord Jesus is always the good Samaritan in life. The Lord Jesus would be the one who stops, the one who helps, the one who has compassion. And the Lord Jesus is the good Samaritan. And we, we know that. Well, we know that. That's no surprise. But the pastor said something more. And this was what really caught me. The pastor said that in, in a real sense, uh, the Lord Jesus in the parable is also the person who has been hurt. The person who was beaten. The one who was lying in the ditch at the side of the road. And when he said that thing, that my first reaction was, that sounds like some kind of strange heresy. What does it mean that the Lord Jesus is the one in the ditch, the one by the side of the road, the one who has been beaten? Didn't understand it at all until he made reference to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, where the Lord Jesus says, said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. And the pastor reminded us that each of those deeds was an act of kindness. Of kindness. The acts of kindness that we do when we forget. The Lord Jesus says to you today, dear one, you might have forgotten, but I will always remember 
your kindness. <laughs> done for this person, done to that person, yes. But when done to other Christians, especially the weakest Christians, the Lord Jesus says that more than you did it for me, in a real way, you did it to me. And although we are saved only through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus upon the cross to enter heaven, the true evidence of being saved, dear one, the proof that you are his, are those kind actions that you are doing every day as you're on the road home to glory. And I promise you this. The day will come when your eyes will close in this world. And because of your kindness, many will thank the Lord for you. But your eyes will open in a better land, in a better place, with our Lord Jesus Christ, through what he did upon the cross. And in that better land, the land of heaven, people will be kind to each other always. Because heaven is a world of love and yet in your kindness you have brought something of that world into this one keep going keep serving keep being kind because David showed kindness for Jonathan's sake we'll do it all for the Lord Jesus Christ Again and again, again and again, again and again, until he takes us home. Amen.